to live is Christ, to die is gain. To know his word and walk his narrow way. There is no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will for me to live. Is Christ, to die is gain. Once my heart was full of sin and shame till someone told Jesus came to save. When he said, come unto me, he set my poor heart free for me to live. His Christ to die is gain. There are things that I still do not know, but of this one thing I'm completely sure. He who called me on that day washed all my sins You may be seated. This time, Brother Hallbegger will take over the Sunday school class. And good morning to you. Good. What a beautiful day. Got up this morning, looked at the thermometer, said 52 degrees. I said, this is amazing. This is wonderful. And uh, I am not a hot weather person. Therefore, many years ago, we lived in Alabama for 10 years, and that was suffering, but it's where the Lord wanted us. <laughs> and so, take your Bibles, uh, please, and turn to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're talking about the, um, the life of Elisha uh, today, uh, beginning on that. Now, last week, we talked about how that Elisha uh, saw Elijah go up into heaven. Well, actually, we didn't quite get there. We're going to get there today. And um, how that Elijah said, Elisha, what shall I do for you? And uh, we're talking in, well, let's, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1. Um, came to pass when the Lord would take up Elisha, uh, Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry ye here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. And Eli Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel uh, said to Elisha, uh, Knowest thou not that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? He said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. That's not what's important right now. We have some things to do yet. Verse 4, And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry ye here, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And then we uh, jump down to verse 10, where it says, well, actually verse 9 um, Elisha uh, is asked by Elijah, ask what I shall do for thee. And Elijah, Elisha says, try to get, keep these names straight here, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. He said, and thou hast asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so, and unto thee, but if not, it shall not be so. And that's where we ended last week. Uh, we're talking about, um, well, that title really doesn't apply because uh, we dealt with that last week, but we split this lesson. And so we're talking about how that um, Elijah was called the selfless prophet. He followed God's leading in verses 1 through 4, and uh, in verses 5 through 10, he focused on others. Primarily, he focused on Elisha. Elijah knew that he was going to be taken by the Lord. He didn't know exactly how it was going to happen. I don't believe God told him how it was going to happen, but he's, he knew that it was going to happen. But even in that moment, he did not center on himself. He centered on the one whom he was training to take the mantle of the prophecy um, from him. What shall I do for you? 
How can I serve you? How can I be a help to you? Is that a testimony of my life? Is that a testimony of your life? Even in those very important times of life, are we still servants? Do we still put the needs of others before our own desires? Elijah did that. That's why he's called the selfless prophet. Now today, we talk about how that uh, Elijah is taken up to heaven. Well, let's see here. In verse 11, and it came to pass, as they still went on, they are now on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Remember last week how that Elijah, uh, as they came to the Jordan River from Jericho, took his mantle, put it together, hit the waters of the Jordan River, and they parted. Uh, so they are now on the eastern side. As they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Wow. What an event. Wouldn't it be great to be able to see something like that? Well, God doesn't act that way uh, in these days. Uh, God acts through his word and uh, not necessarily through miracles. But Elijah is caught up into heaven and he's taken in a, via a chariot of fire and horses of fire and we have the picture. Well, that's the artist's conception of what happened. Um, have no idea what it looked like, but um, Elijah's gone, Elijah has left, the mantle falls from Elijah and Elisha picks it up. So what does he do? Well, let's see. My clicker is not working. We'll do it manually. He took the mantle of Elijah and he goes down to the Jordan River. Well, let's read it here. In verse 12, Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. All right. So he parts the waters of, of the um, Jordan River. Miracle? Was it the par power of the mantle of Elijah? No, it was the power of God. But remember, back in... Oh, let's see, 1 Kings 19 and verse 19, it was this very mantle of Elijah that Elijah had found Elisha out in the field plowing, and he took his mantle and placed it on Elijah as a symbol of his call of Elisha. This same mantle now, Elisha picks up, hits the water of Jordan River. Where is the God of Elijah? He had no, no question where God was. He just made that statement. Maybe because the sons of the prophets were still watching from the other side of the Jordan River and um, he uh, parts the waters. Now remember, Elijah is called the selfless prophet. But now in uh, chapter 2 of 2 um, of, uh, Kings, Elisha is called God's providing prophet. And we have several instances how that Elisha was used to provide for needs of different individuals. But before that happens, in chapter 2, verse 15, the sons of the prophets, they, they have a response here. They, uh, the response is, um, we need to find out whether, I mean, where Elijah is. We saw him go, well, we're not told that they saw him go up. We are told that Elisha saw him go up. But 
he didn't come back. I mean, I mean what happened? Well, God, God took him up in a chariot of fire and a whirlwind. Well, maybe God didn't quite make it. Maybe, maybe, God, maybe God deposited him on a, a mountain somewhere or maybe in a valley somewhere. We need to go out and we need to send 50 of our, of our sons of the prophets out to look for him. Elisha says, no. No, you don't do that. And they persisted. And per- Have you ever done something because someone just doesn't quit asking? Well, that's, that's this, the situation with, with Eli- Elisha here. He says, okay, all right, fine, go. Send 50 men out, look for him. And they hunted for three days and didn't find him. Hmm. What does Elijah say? Get my name straight here. What does Elisha say? Verse 18. When they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? I told you he went to heaven. He's not deposited on some mountaintop or in some valley here. But you insisted, okay. Didn't I tell you not to go? No, God God does what he says he's going to do. He doesn't take a, a prophet of God and deposit him somewhere, hide him somewhere. No, he went to heaven. But where was Elisha at this point? He is at Jericho. And this is the first opportunity for Elisha to be the providing prophet. See the map there? Uh, Yeah, my batteries are dead. Um, So Jericho there, just to the west of the uh, Jordan River. And um, the the men of, of, of Jericho have a message for him. It says in verse 19, the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. This is a good place to live. Well, I mean, it's a great place to live. But it says, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. The water is not good water. There's something wrong with the wells. There's death in the water, so to speak. And Elisha says in verse 20, bring me a new cruise and shalt put therein, a salt therein. And they brought it to him, a new cruise, a new vessel, a vessel, a pottery vessel. It could have been a dish. It could have been a, 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 a vase of some sort, probably a dish that hadn't been used before. Why, why was that important? Well, it wasn't really important, but the symbolism here is it can't be used for something else and, and therefore the power given to, to uh, former use or something, something that hasn't been used before. And we have, there, thank you. But um, anyway, we have the, uh, um, the vessel put salt therein. Was the salt all powerful? No. It's God's power that does it. And so we find that uh, the, um, the, the salt was poured into the well. And what does Elisha say? He says at the end of verse 21, um, I have healed these waters and there shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. Well, he goes from, from here unto Bethel. You see on the map uh, up there. And he was going up by the way, and there came forth little children out of the city and mocked him and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. Little children. No. No, they weren't children as we would know them to be children. Thank you. See if it works now. Yes. It's amazing what batteries do. And um, so, eh, let's catch up here. The young men mock him at Bethel. How young were they? Well, they were old enough to know better for sure. This same Hebrew word that is translated here, young men, or excuse me, little children, 
is used other places in, in Scripture, in the Old Testament. The same Hebrew word is used of Isaac in Genesis chapter 21. At that time, he was 28 years old. The same Hebrew word is used of Joseph in Genesis chapter 41. At that time, he was 39 years old. And so these were not six, seven, eight, nine, ten little a year old children. These were young, uh, these were much older than that. As I said, certainly uh, old enough to know better. It is surmised, we have no proof of this, they might have been students of another teacher in the area of Bethel, and they were coming out and mocking Elisha. Go up, thou bald head, go up. Well, what does Elisha do? It says in verse 24, he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord, and there came forth two she-bearers out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. It doesn't say that, that the she-bearers killed them. They injured them. We don't know for certain what happened, but God brought his judgment on these young men for their rash comments, for their uh, comments of, of disrespect to God's man. But God takes care of it. Their judgment, in verse 24, injury or possibly death. We're not told for certain. From there, in verse 25, he goes from thence to Mount Carmel, and thence he returned to Samaria. We don't know exactly where Elisha lived. Um, he... He did have a place, he did have a, a home at some point. Uh, some believe that he lived in the area of Mount Carmel. Some believe that he lived in the area of the capital city of, of Israel, the northern tribes um, in Samaria. But um, he goes from Mount Car goes to Mark Car Mount Carmel and thence he returned to Samaria. All right, we change gears here. And see the map. All right. Goes to Mount Carmel, back to Samaria, there, and that's where he is. Remember, he's the providing prophet. Now he's going to be used to provide security for the ten northern tribes and Judah. We have the reign of Jehoram also known as Joram. Remember, we talked about him last week. He is the, um, the king in the kingdom of Israel, the northern tribes. Uh, he is the, the uh, son of Ahab. Ahab is off the scene now. Ahab has died. And Je Jehoram is the second king following Ahab. Because remember last week, Ahaziah was the king of Israel. Ahaziah ruled for one year, and uh, he died. He had no sons to succeed him on the throne. Therefore, his brother Jehoram, or Joram, uh, took the throne of Israel. And so we have uh, Jehoram ruling Israel for 12 years. What did he do? How did he rule? It says that he, in verse 1, Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in the Samaria, the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, king of the southern kingdom, and reigned 12 years. And he wrought evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and like his mother. His father, Ahab, his mother, Jezebel. They were all in, in Baal worship. They were all in, in wickedness. For he put away the image of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not from there, therefrom. So what does that mean? He did take down the image of Baal in Samaria, in that area. He did right in that way. But he still followed the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, remember, was the first king of the northern tribes. 
What did Jeroboam do? Remember, several weeks back, he said, I, I need to find a place, uh, build up a place, actually two places uh, for the people to worship as they please up here in Israel because I certainly don't want them going down to, into Judah to Jerusalem to the temple there. I mean, if they do that, they're going to reject me and, and uh, have uh, Rehoboam as their king. And so he built substitute places of worship contrary to what God told the people to do in, in two places. He built these substitute uh, places in, um, in Dan and in Bethel in the northern kingdom. Therefore, it says here in 2 Kings chapter 3 that he cleaved unto the sins of Jeroboam. Who did? Jehoram did. He did put away the image of Baal and he followed the sins of Jeroboam and as we said, that was his substitute religion. But Jehoram has a problem. It says in verse 4, and Mesha, king of Moab. Now you may remember from last week how that when Ahab died, the uh, kingdom of Moab rebelled against uh, Israel. From the time of David, Moab had been a possession of Israel. And when the kingdom split, northern and southern kingdom, Moab went with the northern kingdoms. All right? And so it says, Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lambs, a hundred thousand rams and with the wool. That was the tribute price that the king of Moab paid every year to Israel, to the northern kingdom. But Ahab's dead. We've had the kingdom of Ahaziah for about approximately one year, and now we're into the kingdom of Jehoram, and Misha says, I don't have to do this anymore. Ahab's dead. And he rebelled, saying, I'm not going to do this. Verse 5, but it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled against the king, king of Israel, and King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. He got his army ready to fight. But he said, I'm not powerful enough. I can't go against the kingdom, king of, of Moab. So what happens here? We find, well, there, let's look at the map here. We have the kingdom of Israel up here, kingdom of Judah here. We have the kingdom of Moab right there. All right, so what happens here? It says in verse 7, he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, said, I will go up. I am as thou art, my people as thy people, and my horses as thy horses. Wrong decision. You don't ally with the ungodly to do God's business. You don't do that. It's wrong. We found it to be wrong several chapters back. Same guy did it, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah allied with Ahab, remember, and God brought judgment upon them. But now Jehoshaphat once again, at the end of his rule, at the end of his kingdom in Judah, said, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. Must have had some special horses. I don't know. But in verse 8, We have the king of Moab rebelling. Jehoram and Jehoshaphat join forces in verse 7. Verse 8, which way shall we go up? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. All right, let's go back here. There it is. 
through the wilderness of Edom. They're coming in the back door, trapping Moab. Because Moab goes north, they're back into Israel here. So they come down this way through the wilderness of Edom. We'll go that way. The king of Israel went and the king of Judah and the king of Edom, they ally again with the king of Edom, the ungodly king of Edom. And they fetched a compass of seven days journey and there was no water for the host. The wilderness of Edom, a notoriously dry place. Should have known better to go, go that way. There was no water for the host. I mean, would not a good general leader of an army say, if we go this way, there's not going to be any water, but that's okay. And then they get there and say, whoa, we got a problem. There was no planning, no godly planning in this. Notice what they say in verse 10. The king of Israel said, notice it's Jehoram saying this, alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the land of Moab. We're going to lose for lack of water. We're going to lose. Jehoshaphat, verse 11, said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, here is Elisha, the son of Nebat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. That last phrase, phrase, which poured water on the hands of Elijah, refers to our lesson last week, where it says that Elisha ministered to Elijah. That was his job while Elijah was still around. Verse 12, and Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king and the king of Edom, went down to him, and Elijah, Elisha said unto the king of Israel, okay, we're not told exactly where this happened, possibly in the, in the wilderness of Edom, possibly some other place, but Elisha said unto the king of Israel in verse 13, what have I to do with thee? You're ungodly. You're following in the ways of, of Jeroboam and the sins of Jeroboam. Yes, you took away the, the, the idol of, of Baal, but you, you're not doing right. And he mocks him some here in verse 13. Get thee to the prophets of thy father and the prophets of thy mother. Go, go ask the prophets of Baal. You have nothing to do with me. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. We're going to lose. In verse 14, Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. The message that I have for you today is not for you. It's because of the godly heritage of Jehoshaphat. Now, Jehoshaphat was not acting very godly at this point. But he certainly had the majority of his rule. Therefore, Elisha says, I'm doing this for Jehoshaphat's sake, not for yours. Verse 15, bring me a minstrel. Came to pass when the minstrel played and the hand of the Lord came upon him. He said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. We have the joined forces. God provides water. How does he do that? First of all, Elisha tells these three kings Dig ditches. Dig ditches in this dry, barren area? Dig ditches. Okay. We'll dig ditches. Verse 17, For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, 
neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And the next verse says, this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. This is easy for God. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. He goes on the next few verses. Actually, the next verse, you're going to destroy the fenced cities of Moab, every choice city. You're going to uh, hew down the, the trees of the area so they can't build. You're going to stop up all the wells of their, uh, their wells of water. You're going to mar every piece of land with stones. That was a trick that they used in those days. Not a trick, but a method. When they would go in and, and destroy an area, you know, Israel and that area around there, there's no lack of stones, no lack of rocks in the area. And the agricultural people, the farmers, had spent countless hours, days, months, years clearing the fields of all the stones. The armies would come in and dump the stones back in the fields as a way of destroying, making the land useless. And God tells these three kings through Elisha, you're going to win. It's not going to be for your sake. It's going to be for Jehoshaphat's sake. It's going to be for my name's sake. When God does that which is holy and right, he should get the glory. Not our pitiful little armies, not our pitiful little politicians, not our pitiful little methods. God should get the glory. And God provides the water. Of course, we said, Elisha's message to Jehoram, I'm not doing it for your sake. Not for your sake at all. You don't deserve it. But Elisha's favor to Jehoshaphat for his previous lifestyle. He wasn't living real well right now, but he had in the past. Instructions for God's provision, dig ditches. And they dug ditches. God gives the victory. We find how in verse 20, came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. In that area of the Middle East, we have dry riverbeds. What are the dry riverbeds called? Wadis. Wadi are they called? Yeah, okay. Um, but um, they're called wadis. It is surmised, now we don't know this happened for certain. I mean, God could have just put the water there and he may well have done that. But some also surmise that in that area of northern Edom, there is the wadi called Wadi Asi. A-H-S-Y. And some surmise that it rained north of there somewhere and the wadi came... Okay, wadis, dry riverbeds. The only time they have water in them is when there's a, a great rainstorm and the water gushes down these dry riverbeds and uh, goes into the dry area and then eventually is absorbed by the, by the, the, the dry land and comes to naught until the next rainstorm which is not that, not that uh, uh, prevalent. And so some say, maybe this is the way God did it. Whatever the way God did it is a miracle. And so we find that um, the, the Moabites wake up, verse 21. When all the Moabites heard that the kings were come up to fight against them, they gathered all that were able to put on armor and upward and stood in the border. And they rose up early in the morning and the sun shone upon the water and the Moabites saw the water on the other side as red as blood, the reflection of the sun on the water in the ditches that God put there looked to the Moabite army as blood. They said, oh, oh my, 
Something must have happened. Verse 23, and this blood, the king's... Uh, the kings are surely slain and they have smitten one another. Now therefore Moab to the spoil. Looked at the ditches filled with water. Looked like blood. Something must have happened. I mean the, these three kings must have fought against each other and killed everybody off and, and there's nobody left over there to the spoil. If they were going for the spoil which they thought they were going to find, would they have been prepared for battle? No. Very possibly even left their weapons behind. All they were concerned with at that point was, let me get some of the good stuff that was left by the defeated army. I mean, they killed themselves. That must have been what happened. And they came into the camp of these three kings, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. In verse 24, the Israelites rose up and smote the Moabites. So they fled before them, but they went forward, smiting the Moabites even into their own country. And they beat down the cities and every good piece of land cast every man his stone and filled it. And they stopped all the wells of water and felled all the good trees only in that place. Kereseth, left they the stones thereof, howbeit the slingers went about it and smote it. And the king of Moab saw that the battle was too sore for him. He took with him 700 men that drew, that drew swords to break through even unto the king of Edom, but he could not. We're going to be destroyed utterly. We're going to be decimated. The king of Moab tried everything he could and, and it didn't work against the, the armies of Israel, Judah, and Edom. And Oh, I need to take extreme action here. Now, the king of Moab was a worshiper of Chemosh, the sun god, obviously a false god. Chemosh doesn't exist, but the Moabites thought he did. And as we've said other weeks, all these false religions are based on fear, all of them. I need to do something drastic here. I need to, 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 to somehow get a victory out of this in some way. What's the most drastic thing? How can I impress my God, Chemosh? I know. I'll take my son, my only son. In verse 27 took his eldest son that should have reigned in his stead and offered him for a burnt offering upon the wall. To gain the sympathy of his false God. The news of that sacrifice spread quickly amongst the armies. There was great indignation against Israel. The army said, he did What? The king of Moab did what? He sacrificed his own son? This is terrible. It's horrible. What are we doing here? Let's all go home. Battle was over. They went home. It says at the end of verse 27, and returned to their own land. Did God win the victory? Yes, he did. For whose sake? Jehoshaphat's sake. Jehoshaphat's sake. We have two more things here. Provided sustenance. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. This woman's husband had been one of the sons of the prophets. 
he died. And now thou knowest that my servant, her husband, did fear the Lord. But we owe a debt. And the creditor has come to take unto him my two sons to be a bondman. My husband just died. We owe a debt. I have nothing to pay the debt with. And the, the guy who holds the debt is, is going to come and take my two sons as payment. Did that happen in those days? Yeah. Yeah. I remember very distinctly the first time I heard the, two, the true account of how my own father was in that situation. Only he was the son. It's probably about the year 1933, somewhere in there. He was 16 or 17 years old, junior in high school, good student, wanted to go on to college. I heard later on, much later on, Mr. Stein, to be a history teacher. I had no idea. That was my area of teaching. I found out later. His own father had a debt that he couldn't pay. And the creditor said, okay, give me your son. And my own father worked for that man lived with that man's family for 18 months to pay off the debt. I said, Dad, why didn't you go back to, to school when you're done? I was too old. The depression was still on. I needed to earn money for the family. Yeah, it happened in Bible times, but it's happened since then also. You know, the great thing about that was my dad could have had every reason in the world to be bitter, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He said that was the Lord's doing. It was the Lord's doing. But here this woman is about to lose her two sons. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Remember? He provides. Tell me. What hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Now we don't know whether it was a pot of olive oil. Some commentators say that that's what it was. Some say it was oil that you anoint yourself with following bathing. We're not told what type it is. But that's all she had. Elisha says to her, Go borrow thee vessels, verse 3. Abroad of all thy neighbors and even empty vessels, borrow not a few. When thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out unto all these vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Notice, that's all he told her to do. He didn't tell her what was going to happen. God does not give us the complete answer to our situation, to our problems all the time. The right thing to do, the biblical thing to do is to follow God's instructions step by step and he will eventually lead us to his complete answer. It takes faith to do that. You ever been there? I'm sure many of you have. Probably most, if not all. You follow God step by step, obediently, and when you do that, he will eventually take you to the place he wants you to be at. But at the beginning of that whole process, you don't see the end result. That's the importance of step by step obedience. 
I've taught with young people all my adult life. I've asked, I had to answer questions uh, many times. Mr. Habegger, how do I know God's will? How do I find what God wants me to do? I say, you obey him step by step today and again tomorrow and again the next day and he will eventually lead you to his will because the whole process is his will. If you're in college, you're doing his will to prepare for something later. And then you do something else to prepare for something later. We still do it, don't we? We're still following God step by step. I hope. That's the biblical way. Elisha didn't tell her what the end result was going to be. But in verse 6, came to pass when the vessels were full that she, she said unto her son, bring me yet another vessel. And he, uh, he said unto her, there's not another vessel more. And the oil stayed. <laughs> poor, poor, poor. I need another vessel. We don't have any more. Oh, the pitcher is empty. God's perfect timing. And then, and only then, in verse 7, she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay the debt and live of the rest. And one last thing quickly. Elisha gives instructions. The woman's family is saved. Now he provides life. Very familiar story. The Shunammites' generosity. We don't have time to read all the verses, but fell on a day, verse 8, that Elisha passed to Shuman, where was a great woman that has no reference to size, reference to her goodness, her generosity. Her importance, a great woman. She constrained him to eat bread. And so that it was that as often as she, he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. She was generous to Elisha and his servant Gehazi. In fact, as we know the account in verse 10, she says to her husband, let's make a chamber for them. And every time they come by this way, they can stop in here. They, they can have a place to, to sleep. They can have a place of, of sustenance. Let's, let's do that for them. And they were generous. And, and Elisha was, was grateful for it. I'm sure Gehazi was as well. It says in verse 12, he says to Gehazi, the next time they were there, call the Shunammite. And, and when he called her, she stood before him. He says in the next verse, what can I do for you? What can I, how can I repay you for your generosity? Can I, can I give a good word to the king? Can I give a good word to, to the, the captain of the army? And she said, I'm fine. I dwell among my own people. You don't have to do anything. Gehazi says, Psst, hey, I know something that can be done. She has a sadness in her heart that she hasn't said to, to you yet. She's advanced in age. Her husband is advanced in age and she has no child. She's barren. Ah, God can do that. Verse 14, she hath no child. And he goes to, to the, the woman and says, a year from now, you're going to have a child. <laughs> what does she say? Do not lie unto thine handmaid. But in verse 17, the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said to her, according to the time of life. The child was born miraculously. The child grows. We don't know exactly how old the child is, but he goes out to the field one day at the time of, of harvest and 
He goes out probably just to, to be with his, his dad and, and, his, uh, and then the, 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 the men who were harvesting. And he says, my head, my head. Verse 19, very possibly sunstroke. The child is sent home to mama, lays on her knees until noon, but then dies. You ever had anything really tragic happen in your life? Yeah. God allows those things in our lives for our growth. They're very difficult times. Could be a sickness, could be a death in the family, could be something else, could be financial. Could be a host of different things. When things like that happen to us, I'm sure there's people in here who maybe even be going through something like that right now. I don't know. But Satan comes to us at that time and says, See, God is not good. God took this away from you. God did this. Don't listen to him. During times of trial and, and hardship, that is the time when you flee to God, not flee from him. Some people have experienced tragic things in their life and said, I'm done with church, I'm done with God, I'm done with, with, with all this stuff. That's the exact opposite of what they need to do. When times of hardship, times of trial come, you flee to the church, you flee to godly people, you flee to God. That's how you grow. Almost 33 years ago, our family, and some of you have experienced things like this as well. 33 years ago in, in August, we lost a, a child, Andy. Tragic accident. My mom and dad, and my wife's mom and dad, I mean, at the time, we, we were hurting. We never even thought how ma they must have been hurting until years later. I said, huh, that was a hard time for them too. Well, how selfish we were. But they'd taught both of us, you flee to God in times of trial. We fled to the church. We fled to some of you. God met our need. Turn it into a victory. If I had time today, I could tell you event after event and situation after situation that that one event made it possible for us to do. God was in charge. The Shunammite woman fled to God. She fled to Elisha. Oh yeah, she was grief stricken. And I don't have time to, to deal with it all this morning. But she went to the right source of help. She didn't chuck her religion. She didn't say, that's it, I'm done with it. She went to the right place. Yes, in God's providence... He did raise her son. Elisha went to her house, laid upon the child. Warmth came to the child's dead body. We find the son dies. She flees to Mount Carmel where Elisha is. 
She says, I, remember I didn't ask for a son, but God gave me one. What am I to do now? Eventually, Elisha goes to the little chamber that she'd built for him in Gehazi and raises that son back to life. The woman receives her living son. Not every time that we have a difficulty in our life, not every time that we have a tragic situation in our life does God bring someone back to life. I mean, no, of course not. But every time, now listen carefully, every time God's grace is sufficient. And we can have the victory. But only through God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your grace and your love. Thank you for your plan for our life. May we not just be puppets, but may we be submissive servants that you might use us and work through us to your glory and your honor and not to ourselves. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.